Hi, and welcome everybody to this oral session about cyberbullying and bullying prevention. My name is Kalle Gustafsson. I'm head of edu education at Stiftelsen Friends. And I have the great honor to be the host uh, for this session and these 55 minutes. Uh, we will have three speakers here today. And they will speak for 15 minutes each. And the whole time you have the possibility to send in questions via our platform. If you're in the room, please use your QR code over here. And if you're with us online, you have a Q&A function. Please use that and not the chat. Um, we will end this with uh, about 10 minutes uh, for questions. Now let me welcome and introduce the first speaker. And there's been a little change. Instead of uh, Sofia Berne, we have Sofie Josefsson, who will talk about children's experience of having nude images or videos shared without consent. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, having one's self-generated nude images shared without consent is one of the most common topics uh, among children contacting our helpline. When a child is faced with having images disseminated among friends, family, or via popular social media, uh, most of them feel responsible for being abused, and the community, the close community surrounding the child, often put the blame on the child for being stupid, immature, for sharing the images in the first place. And this blame might lead to the child not a rich, wanting to reach out and therefore be left alone in a rapidly escalating situation. And my name is Sofie Josefsson. I'm the senior child rights advisor at ECPAT Sweden. And I'm also the project manager for DIT ECPAT or your ECPAT. Uh, and I'm very grateful to be here today to speak about our work with helping children who have had their nude images shared without consent uh, with support and also to help them remove these images. Uh, from remove these in images from where they are being disseminated. Um, and your ECPAT is a digital platform, ditecpat.se, um, and a helpline providing support via chat, via uh, telephone, and via email. And in addition to DIT ECPAT, we also have ECPAT Hotline, which is an internet-based internet tip line where the public can anonymously report uh, suspected child sexual exploitation material or child sexual exploitation within Sweden and from Swedish perpetrators in different countries. And our vision is a world without sexual abuse of children. And in Sweden, we work to increase the knowledge uh, and share information. And we also collaborate with the Finance and Telecom Coalition, with IT tech, gaming, and travel industry to strengthen the rights for children and the protection of sexual exploitation. And when I mean self, uh, self-generated sexual, sexual exploitation material uh, is uh, images that children have taken of themselves, nude images and videos that children have taken of themselves. And these images can be often be taken uh, in a voluntary relationship and it can be a part of flirting or uh, strengthening the relationship. But it can also be a result of threats or pressure. Um, and we saw in 2018 in our hotline an increase in these kind of images um, on the self-generated explicit material. We also saw that the children that were in the start, perhaps 15, 16 year olds, we're now turning seven and eight year olds that were photographing themselves in this way. And the research is in, in Sweden as well as abroad um, was studied the psychological impact of having one's images spread and shared without consent. And the conclusion in, in itself was just that the possibility of having these images sent or shared without consent uh, made a negative impact on the psychological health of these children and increase the symptoms of, for instance, PTSD. And each time this self-generated material that is viewed without the child's consent is re-victimizing for the child. And the children that are in contact with your ECPAT also express that there's a stress of not knowing if your friends, your family, and your close community have seen these images. Um, so it can have 
effects on the child, both short-term and long-term. And uh, therefore, we, we felt the prompt need to start helping these children, both with support when the situation, uh, in the situation that they were, but also to help them to remove these images. Uh, we started the helpline, the ECPAT, a year ago, uh, in the end of November. And since then, we, uh, in Sweden, we only have two million children, so this is half of them. And probably a majority of all children that are online have been reached by our information. And it's for us, we, we communicate with children through social media, for instance, through Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. And we're all in all the places where the children are themselves. And we've had 1,500 contacts, uh, but we've seen in the last two months that there's been an exponential increase in the amount of contacts. So now we are up to about five, 600 contacts a month. Um, and one of the absolute most common topics is having your images shared without consent. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, the support line will also provide help with removal of these images. And we have about five to 10 children each month that contact us for the, for the support and help of the removal. Uh, one common challenge for us is in order for us to help the child, uh, the child needs to have access to the image or the video that's been dis disseminated or a link to the web page where it's been spread. And often children are ashamed and, and afraid that their parents will look through their phones, so they're, they're deleting the images, which makes it harder for us to help them since we have uh, projects called Project Arachnid where there's a web crawler, and the web crawler needs the hash value or the fingerprint of the image in order to remove it. So therefore, we need the child to save the image that has been sent, otherwise we can't help them. Uh, of course, we can help them contact the platforms if they need, uh, but we can't remove the image. Um, and the average uh, age of the children contacting us is 14, and half of them are boys which is very unusual when it comes to support lines in Sweden, where most of uh, the children that are contacts are uh, young girls. So what do we know about self-generated material and the children's experiences so far? Well, when it comes to the material, uh, many of the victims, especially the young girls, are victims of repeated multiple victimization. In addition to having one's images shared without consent, uh, which is a sexual offense in Sweden in itself, the children is often subjected to threats, cyberbullying, and other forms of violence. Many have also received unwanted images from other children, young people, and adults. I think this is a, this is a quote from a young girl that's been in contact with us that clearly illustrates how many different forms of criminal acts you can be subjected to. Uh, it's not just images. Um, and uh, unlikely to what you might have heard earlier, the offender is often another child. Uh, it's common, more common, especially when it comes to girls, that it's another child than it's an adult. It can be a former partner, it can be a fling, it can be a classmate, or someone you have, someone you know. Uh, and several of the young girls that have contacted us, they are below the age of 14, and it's quite common that they've been contacted uh, by boys that are 17 or 18 and older. And when you talk to these young girls two or three years after the abuse, uh, they feel that it's that's been a part of like a grooming process, that these older boys target the younger girls because they know they're not as mature as the older girls, and it's easier to put pressure on them. Um, and we also have a lot of contacts with boys that have received unwanted uh, nude images from girls. And since there's gender roles that says that boys should be happy about receiving nude images from girls, it's hard to talk to them about... The f they don't know it's illegal, and it's very hard for them to, uh, to talk to friends or to, uh, to, to the support system, because they're, they're expected to be happy when this happens. Um, we also see that, uh, like with adult perpetrators, that the nude images is a form of value in itself uh, that can be shared among groups of boys in order to 
gain higher social status or popularity or um, strengthen the bonds within that group. Um, so, and in general, um, both boys and girls and adults need more knowledge of what's legal and what's not when it comes to nude images. Um, victims that have had their material shared, they are often shamed, both by uh, peers, but also by, uh, um, by teachers, by parents, by the community. In particular, girls, they are expected to take responsibility for their own exploitation. Um, we've seen that the kind of discussion that go, is going on among children, young girls that are uh, sending nudes is the same kind of discussions we had uh, with rape and women a couple of years ago, uh, that you should not be wearing certain clothes, you should not be in certain places, and because then, you ha then it's your own fault. And these kind of discussions we can see among young people, which is really worrisome. Um, they feel ashamed and foolish. Um, and this shame is uh, making them very hard to reach out to caretakers or to other adults that actually can help them with their situations. Um, and, and children themselves, they are left alone on these online platforms, exploring their sexualities. And a lot of adults are not unaware of what's going on here. Um, uh, and sometimes they have strategies to try to keep them si safe or try to keep them from being exploited. Uh, they can send images with covering their face. Many of them only send, send to people they know, because trust. if you trust someone, they're not going to hurt They're not going to hurt you. Um, and sometimes they're, they're blocking and saying no, but, but um, most of the common, uh, common strategies that they help are not based on the fact that the most uh, the co most common perpetrator is someone they know and someone they might go and be in the same classroom. And it's not very helpful to block someone online when you're meeting the next day in school. And uh, even though you trust someone, it's your boyfriend, when the relationship ends, that person might be the one who spreads these images. Uh, so we need to make sure that the strategies that young people have actually is, is based on their realities today. And unfortunately, in the specific cases where children actually have been in contact with school counselors, they have not been received the help that they have, they have the right to receive. Um, having once nude images shared is a criminal offense and should be treated as such. That means that you should report it to the police. Sometimes you need to contact the social services. Um, and the school management needs to be involved. We also have a lot of cases where there's many people within a class that's spreading these kind of images. It can be through a VIS uh, class chat, or for instance. And many people can be involved and be both victims and, and perpetrators within these situations. Um, and when it comes to uh, having these images shared, it's very uh, it's important to act immediately, both to save the evidence for former criminal investigation, but also it's easier for us to stop the dissemination if the child is, gets help quick. Sometimes we have, we have cases where the images have been circling for years before the child reached out for help, and then it's all over the internet, and it's harder for us to help. Um, we also have had some cases where adults, uh, whether it's caretakers or teachers, are expressing negative views on sharing nude images among children. And you can have your own, I mean, you can have your own feelings about spreading nude images, but the fact is that this is a way for children to interact. And when you're stating that this is something shameful or this is something that only spe specific types of girls do, then it's going to be really hard for the child to speak out when they are being abused. So uh, this is just a, uh, just a sneak peek of everything we've been done for the last year. But we'll be launching a report in uh, two weeks about sexual exploitation in Sweden, where this issue is something that we will be talking more to. We've been speaking to 13,000 children in Sweden from the ages 10 to 17 about unwanted sexual images, sexual assault, and other sexual offenses. 
and they've con contributed in different ways to the report. And it will be available in both English and Swedish. Uh, we also will be launching a teacher's guide. We've had some conferences with teachers where we feel that there's uh, there's a need for doing the right thing, but it's hard to know how to talk about sex and sexting and consent online within with children. Uh, so that will be coming later this year. And we also are actively engaging with children through social media on the platforms where they are. Um, you're probably not seeing our ads because you're, most of you might not be under 18, but we're only focusing on the group between 10 and 17. And uh, just to sum up this, session, I think it's important to take into account that young people live their lives online today. It's not online and offline, it's one life, which means that they're going to be sexually exploring online as well as offline. And it's nothing, it's, I mean, uh, children have been exploring their sexuality forever and will continue, no matter what we think about it or not. Uh, or what our opinions or requests are, they will flirt, they will be sexting, and they will be sharing these types of images. And in order to help them to stay safe, it's important that we have the knowledge of how rela children's relationships are today. And therefore, we think that, I mean, sexting, consent, and boundaries are important topics that we need to be discussing with our kids within schools. Uh, and they should be an important part of our sexual education. And also, when a child is, uh, has her, his, his or her self-generated material shared without consent, that child is a victim of an offense and should be treated as such. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, next speaker here is uh, Jay, Jo uh, Vake and Andrea Ballarnest and they will talk about using VR to enable learning of effective bystander behavior. Welcome. Okay, um, <clears throat> thanks for coming. Uh, I am Ayu, and this is Andrea, and we're going to present um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, exploratory um, pilot study of uh, develop, uh, developing uh, immersive environments for um, learning uh, bystander behavior against bullying, effective bystander behavior against bullying. Uh, it's a collaboration. The study was a collaboration between Norse and uh, from Bergen. Um, and it's the Andreas from the OVS uh, bullying prevention program, and I'm from the technology side. And we also work with a local startup company from Bergen that uh, specializes in developing uh, 360 video experiences for um, facilitating learning processes. <coughs> so to give a little bit of uh, background first, uh, from the technology side, this is uh, inspired by theories such as uh, human-computer interactions. And, uh, which is a <coughs> scientific study of uh, interfaces between people and machines. And it's particularly oriented towards uh, developing new and novel and uh, not seen before ways of interacting with computers. And uh, also captures the no notion that uh, interaction between humans and computers are often open. It's not, it's not something that you can necessarily plan in detail in, in advance. Um, it's also inspired by design science, so it's a little bit, uh, which is a little bit different from much of the presentations I've seen, the empirical presentations I've seen so far here. It's more exploration and problem exploration through uh, designing things, digital things. And um, for this uh, study, we particularly um, <coughs> took the approach of uh, participatory design, uh, which is um, a way of designing. Uh, technology that originated in uh, Scandinavia, in Denmark and uh, Norway in, um, in the 70s, uh, which originally was a project uh, of, it had a sort of democratic goal of uh, including those who were affected by uh, technology or solution in the design. Um, <clears throat> and later it's also, so in addition to being a, a, like a goal of representation, a democratic goal of representation, it's also 
um, a way of uh, capturing the knowledge, the tacit knowledge of uh, those who are involved in a domain that uh, you as a, a, a digital technology designer not, doesn't necessarily know. Uh, so those who are in a use situation have like the knowledge that uh, is relevant for the design that they have to, you have to involve them to capture it. Yeah. Uh, the technology that we used with, uh, worked with is uh, stereoscopic video, which is one way of creating uh, immersive environments. Uh, it's uh, it can it's a little bit different from virtual reality, which is uh, 3D graphics based. Uh, and they have different um, characteristics. Um, in general, you can say that uh, graphics-based VR environments are better for uh, suited for creating interaction, which is would, which is uh, excellent uh, when you're uh, designing learning technology. And um, <clears throat> the, it also requires a lot more resources to develop and takes a lot more time. While stereoscopic video you might argue it's more uh, immersive. It, it um, feels more uh, like being there than uh, when you don't have the graphic uh, interaction. And it's also fairly easy to, uh, to develop. So it's suited for prototyping, which we are interested in. <coughs> so uh, I will say some words about uh, uh, bullying and bystander uh, behavior as an important aspect uh, in this uh, trial. Uh, during the past decades uh, of implementing and on doing research on the OBPP, the Always Bowling uh, Prevention Program, uh, we have seen that the social context of interaction and interaction uh, between uh, the students have become of greater uh, importance. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, not really a new turn of uh, the, the research field. Uh, it's more like a development. Um, and uh, it's not a very new thing, as it has been stated from some of the speakers in this uh, conference. Uh, how the uh, aggressor have behave and how the victimized pupil react uh, is of course determined uh, of the social context but also individual uh, uh, features and uh, and also um <coughs> the the social yeah the social context but also personal uh, disposition furthermore uh, the attitudes of the and uh, also the the um, uh, reaction of the bystanders have a vast impact uh, really on both the outcome of the bullying incidents, but moreover also the mental uh, consequences, uh, how they will inflict on the victimized uh, student. This has uh, thoroughly been investigated by Christina Salmevalli uh, and her collaborators through this uh, bystander uh, studies. Uh, this pinpoints really the importance uh, of uh, the school's abilities to, um, to train and uh, to work with positive and constructive bystander uh, behavior. So this is really also pinpoints the uh, importance of this uh, uh, and connects it to our trial. Then. Yeah. So uh, this is the, the bullying circle, quite well known for most of you, I guess. Uh, the bullying circle is developed uh, partly by Christina Salmevalli and partly by Donald Weus, and it has become a very important framework for uh, communication with the students participating in our current trial. And uh, it describes really the, the roles uh, uh, and attitudes and actions, really, of the bystanders in a bullying situation. And this model, besides the concept of bullying, and also um, we, we also talked, reflected upon um, like typical uh, girls bullying and boys bullying. We, we did uh, a workshop on that uh, with the, the student that participated. Uh, and that was really merrily the thing that we went through uh, before the students started to work with uh, with uh, the workshop and the scenario. So now you will invite you into the design and also into the workshops. Yeah. 
So the idea is, the basic idea that we had is that um, um, since bystanders affect bullying in cl classes, uh, then it um, should be possible to affect uh, it, and it should also, um, and, and there are some ways that are more constructive and than other, others in preventing. Uh, so what if we try to make some example of these and then use them as uh, learning materials? So what we are designing, if you can imagine um, uh, the learning environment, I'm using Barbara Watson's model of the learning environment here to explain. <clears throat> so a learning uh, situation or a, uh, in a school or, so, or wherever is like a part of a complex that was kind of consisting of different actors such as teachers, uh, designers, fellow learning, learners or peers, and then tools that they use and material um, uh, that they also use. And this can be put together in different uh, ways that are more or less ideal. But what we are making uh, through this, uh, uh, in this workshop are can, can be said the tools and the learning materials. And then they have, have to inter be integrated later with the uh, environment consisting of teachers and fellow learners and ways of assessing and uh, a school context and so on. <coughs> so, um, in order to explore uh, how we could involve secondary school students in designing um, learning uh, environments and immersive environments for teaching anti-bullying um, behavior or effective bystander behavior, we organized a workshop. And the re research question was, how can we facilitate secondary school students in designing and prototyping immersive scenarios to be used in to illustrate bullying and constructive bystander behavior in school. And the goal was to uh, see if this, this method of developing was uh, viable, uh, quite simply. So we recruited 10 students from a school around Bergen, secondary school, and they were aged uh, uh, 15 to 16. Um, <coughs> uh, they worked uh, 10 hours over two days. Um, yeah. They were able to use their school hours to do this, and they came from. Uh, they were recruited from uh, uh, by the headmaster uh, of the school uh, from a subject called Sal uh, Oagsena in Norwegian. Uh, it's called um, theater and stage. Uh, so they were uh, involved in music and theater plays and so on. So they have like a creative uh, interest. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so we did, uh, devised a plan for how, how they were to work, and this is what we were testing in the study. So we had a start session, or an onboarding session, if you will, where we gave uh, presentations on how to design technology, uh, different aspects of bullying and bystander behavior, and also in more detail about uh, technology that they were going to use. Then we suggested a process for them where they worked... Uh, inwardly in a group to generate ideas and then use role-playing to act them out. We also presented a um, <coughs> um, VR design tool called um, Interactive uh, Storyboards, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, which is uh, you draw um, a bird's eye view of a scene and then place a circle over it that you can twist um, so and it's to highlight the fact that in a 360 video, you don't necessarily control what the uh, viewer wants to see, but you have to plan so that um, uh, the viewer sees uh, the relevant things, and then to self-evaluate. And af we did that uh, in, uh, over uh, the course of a day, and afterwards we recorded, um, they acted out and recorded the, the, the scenario that they created. <coughs> um, yeah. After the first day, um, we um, helped them with um, putting this together. Uh, this is uh, it's called uh, it's a process called stitching, where you're blurring the lines with the over overlapping uh, fields of view of the camera. It takes a lot of time, and um, yes, we could have involved them in that as well, but it, it wasn't possible within the uh, time frame. Uh, the equipment that we used was a um, stereoscopic camera called the Insta360 Pro 2. It's a professional grade uh, camera that you can place in a room and then control it uh, using a mobile phone from outside the room. So you don't have to be present and interfere with, the, with what is going on. Um, we also used the Oculus Quest 2 to review the material un underway. 
and we had a, a second um, like lower quality uh, stereoscopic camera in uh, backup. <coughs> okay. So yeah. I can, I can <coughs> shortly explain uh, maybe the, the first uh, scenario that uh, the students uh, decided to make. And um, actually, we, we, they had uh, uh, freedom just to design everything themselves and to, uh, to uh, distribute roles and everything. So they had full freedom of uh, what they would like to, to make and so on. And uh, of course, me and you, we were very curious uh, what they came up with. So this was the first of three uh, scenes. And here, uh, it's, uh, this is a typical scene uh, with physical aggression and uh, what we call like direct, obvious bullying. It's easy to detect. But in this situation, the teacher is not present in the room. It's like before. Uh, class or, uh, or uh, yeah, and and the teacher is not there. So uh, <coughs> what you see now from your view is th uh, also the viewer of the bystander uh, that uh, that uh, see what's uh, uh, can can what occurs and what's going on. So here uh, in this scene, two boys are coming into the classroom. You can see them with the long curly hair, <laughs> two boys, and uh, they are uh, they come into the room and they curl a piece of paper and they uh, throw it actually on the the student that is sitting in in front, and then they uh, actually turn to him, go over to him, and they criticize his uh, uh, drawing. And uh, after a while, they also take his drawing, throw it on the floor, and also his, uh, his uh, pencils. Uh, the viewer can observe everything from this uh, position. And they also, uh, 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 the person can also see that the other students, they uh, don't react. They, some giggles, uh, some don't react at all. and. Uh, uh, the viewer can also then um, uh, notice that the teacher comes into the room and tries to ask what's going on here, but doesn't do anything special, and just starts to, to teach the class. And then it settles down, really. But you get, yeah, so you can, you, you can maybe explain the next uh, scene yes, they made. Actually, I'd hope to uh, show this uh, streaming uh, directly, but we got some techno technical problems and we're unable to. Uh, but this, in, and uh, I should also say that uh, they self-organized into three groups and, and uh, created one uh, scenario each. So in this is more like, um, it's called blicking in Norwegian, I don't know what it's called in English, but it's using your eyes like suggestively to indicate some kind of, um, like um, to provoke someone or, or something like that. And it's more a tacit like uh, saying not so nice things. So the, scene, the victim is in the scene is the girl with the red trousers. And the uh, uh, scene is about two girls, um, the ones are, uh, that are standing close to the, um, the whiteboard. They walk past and they just drop a comment about uh, uh, the victim having spent time with a boy over the weekend and why would he do that because she was not attractive and so on. And then just walk past and they uh, look, like, look uh, at her afterwards. And um, the bystanders react sort of differently. Uh, some of them don't react. and. The girl <coughs> in the black uh, shirt like goes over to comfort her, yeah. and then they made one scenario with digital bullying. Yeah, and that was uh, uh, the viewer here uh, sits in the back of the classroom, and there is a phone in front of the viewer. You can see it lying there, and uh, one of the girls comes into the classroom in front, and she stumbles with her books, and uh, books falls on to the ground. And then one of the girls in front, on the left-hand side, you can see her back. She uh, grabs her phone and takes a picture. And <coughs> then you could actually see that and hear uh, that uh, when you are wearing your <laughs> glasses, that the phone beeps in front of you, and uh, you can hear the sound as well. So, and you can hear several phones beeping in the classroom. So it's obvious that this girl who took the picture sent this to everybody when the girl was uh, in a uh, very, very uh, uh, strange and, and like painful position. 
So uh, this was the three uh, different scenarios uh, they, yeah, yes. they made. Yes, I think we have to move on quite quickly now <laughs> because of time. Uh, yes, but uh, in general, the, like the, the workshop went to a large degree how we had planned. Uh, we had planned for a lot of um, uh, feedback uh, between groups, between the facilitators and the participants, and uh, between the other groups and the participants, and it's uh, like worked quite well in for them to refine their uh, scenarios. <coughs> Uh, within the group collaboration, we had some propositions for them how to do, but they lar largely self-organized and used the different tools they found useful and so on. And we also found that role-playing was quite uh, central in, um, in for them to uh, achieve their results. They used it for self-reflection and also to, um, when because they used these, each others as extras in the um, scenarios, they used the role-playing to explain to the others how to what to do, basically, yeah. We also uh, did some interviews where we, uh, we got some feedback on um, how the different aspects worked. Um, yeah, I'll just skip them to, since we are well over time here, mm. and say thank you for listening. We are looking for ways to expand this and go into more schools and use more different kinds of technology. So, mm. thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for that very interesting. <coughs> uh, we have the uh, the last speaker, uh, and I will remind you to uh, send in your questions if you have any. Uh, but the last speaker is Essie Allo, and she will talk about Laika, practical value-based platform in schools for a safer internet. Welcome. Thank you. Had a green alley. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me. What an honor to be here. A familiar face here and also there. <laughs> uh, so my name is Essie Alho. I'm the operational officer at the Prince Couples Foundation, or the long name, uh, Prince Carl Philips and Princess Sophia's Foundation. And in Swedish, uh, Prince Barat Stiftelse. Uh, and before I jump into my uh, presentation, I just want to give you a quick background on the foundation. Uh, our vision is all children and youth should have the possibility of being themselves. So that is our main target group, children and young people. But we also work a lot with um, people around children. So schools, uh, uh, it could be um, uh, the police, whatever. Um, so, And uh, the foundation was uh, founded in 2015 in connection to the Prince Couple's wedding. And our operational areas are based on their uh, personal commitment. And they are a safer internet uh, and also dyslexia. Uh, and one of our core values alongside acting as a collective power is to disseminate knowledge uh, with innovation. So that's a little bit about us. And here's a picture of the Prince couple. Uh, quite a good looking couple, I would say. <laughs> uh, yes. And it, just to start off, uh, a bit of uh, statistics from Gothenburg University. Um, they found that actually 70% of all the children that were interviewed in this study really want to talk to adults about their lives online. But most of them feel that they can't or that they don't, uh, they don't have the time or possibility to do that because adults, we're not available for them. So this is a really interesting and important reminder, I think, to always carry uh, with us, that we have to, as adults, be available and that we have to kind of facilitate the conversation and be there for children and young people. But so Laika, that's kind of, it kind of was born from this uh, statistic, uh, because at the Prince Couples Foundation we, you know, did our research obviously and, uh, and uh, it's very troubling the situation for, um, for young people today. Uh, online that there is a lot of hate and uh, negativity, sexual, sexual harassment. Uh, and so our kind of answer to, to the problem was to create a platform um, where schools could actively work with these issues. And the platform is uh, actually um, created with uh, a great, uh, really awesome uh, advisory board. And we have a, a member of the advisory board, Björn, sitting here with us, professor at uh, Örebro University. Uh, and so we created Laika. 
Uh, and just before I, I tell you a bit more about Laika, I just want to give you a quick background and uh, some more statistics on the situation in Sweden. And this is Swedish research, but I would say that this is probably, you know, not, it's the situation is probably not that different uh, around the world. Uh, but so, uh, a report from uh, um, Scandia Idéer för Livet, it's a Swedish uh, a a foundation also connected to a... Uh, um, Sorry, major mom brain here. I have a little baby outside and I forgot the insurance company. Connected to an insurance company. Uh, and they found in this report that more than half uh, of the youth aged 12 to 24 uh, have experienced mental health issues in Sweden. More than ha half. Uh, so quite a large number. Uh, Swedish youth rank last in mental well-being in all of the European Union. Also quite troubling and maybe a bit surprising, uh, for us Swedes at least, uh, because we often have a self-image, uh, you know, that Sweden is a wonderful, happy, um, positive country and that we basically don't have any issues. Uh, and also the relationship between social media and mental health is quite widely unexplored, as, as many of you might know. Uh, there aren't really, you know, uh, any statistics that, that say this is this and this is that. Uh, but, you know, the increased use of social media by youth at least coincides with the decreasing mental health. So that's what Cadme said about the correlation. Um, the Swedish State Media Council uh, did a really interesting research overview, actually uh, by the same researchers uh, from Gothenburg University uh, that have provided us with the statistic in the beginning of 70%. Um, uh, and they found that uh, positive relationships and conversations with adults about life online is a very good protective factor. I think this is common sense, but it's important to have it uh, in research form as well. Uh, general, there's a general indication that more time online increases the risk of both being subjected and subjecting others to cyberbullying. And I think this statistic is quite an interesting uh, now, um, you know, in the post-COVID life, because we know that, at least here in Sweden, uh, when we talk to schools and parents, uh, many uh, seem to think that children are actually spending a bit more time online now uh, because of, uh, you know, um, COVID and lockdowns and uh, other activities being cancelled. Uh, and then they found that there are, uh, uh, there are elements that make communication online more aggressive, such as, you know, not being able to see facial expressions or, you know, jokes being hard to kind of uh, convey in that context. Uh, and then just to kind of um, give you a bit of a more um, a picture, uh, a survey by Tele2, is, which is a phone operating uh, company, um, they found that 44% have met new friends online uh, and 60% enjoy the access to information. So of obviously the internet is a wonderful thing and it's important to, to also talk about the possibilities uh, connected to uh, online life and not just talk about the negative aspects, which we kind of tend to do because that's our core business to talk about uh, bullying and um, uh, a safer, um, creating a safer internet. And 62% uh, of the people or the youth uh, asked also agreed that people are meaner to each other online. Um, and I think that's not a surprising uh, thing at all. But, uh, I th and I think it's also very true for us adults. I don't know if you agree with me, but I would definitely agree. So that's kind of a background just to sum it up and uh, paint a picture. Um, so, yeah. What the solution is, uh, kind of, or one of the many solutions uh, from our perspective, is to um, to kind of address to address these issues is to to work with core values uh, in school, uh, because we know also from experience, from research, and from many conversations with schools around uh, Sweden and uh, our partner schools, is that it is uh, easier. Uh, to be aggressive or mean online. And this is an issue in school contexts because many teachers and schools uh, feel like they're overwhelmed with all these conflicts that happen online and they kind of um, come into the classroom and take up a lot of time. Um, so that's something that we really know, that th this is uh, an issue that we have. 
Uh, and we also know that a positive environment in school is a very good protective factor. So having a good, safe, uh, positive environment in school is actually one of the, the greatest things we can give our children and young people. So that's something that we know, and this is something that we took with us when we created Laika. Uh, and here is, uh, I had a little film, it's in Swedish, I'm not going to show it today, uh, because time is uh, short. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a film uh, where uh, one of the, our students at our partner school, uh, they read uh, quotes that were sent, sent to us, or stories that were sent to us at the foundation. Uh, there are um, you know, stories about uh, hate, sexual harassment online, uh, cyberbullying. Uh, and the stories are connected to modules uh, where the, the students or the, the class, they, they watch the short film and then they work with exercises. But I'll tell you a bit more about like the, uh, the basics of Laika later. But um, uh, for those of you who have a slight understanding of Swedish, or maybe Google Translate works, I don't know, uh, you can find the films uh, um, on the site. But yeah, so more about core values. And in Sweden, I don't know how it is in, uh, internationally in other countries, but in Sweden, the kind of the curriculum is, is built in two blocks. So we have the, um, how should we say, the knowledge block that is about you know, what the children need to learn, when, in what way, and, and that kind of stuff. So you know, math, the whole you know, curriculum for, for learning math is kind of very strictly set up from the first grade to last grade. Um, and then we have the other block that is core values. And core values is the ethical perspective uh, in, in schools. And this is just freely kind of um, translated from Swedish to, to, um, to English. So please don't quote me on this one. But you get the idea uh, that the ethical perspective is very, very important. It is as important as the knowledge part in school. Uh, and it also should be present in all school activities to encourage the students' ability to make personal decisions and act responsibly. So you understand, this is not like a little thing that you should do maybe now and then. In Sweden, we've actually said, the politicians and, and all of us, you know, uh, kind of uh, working in schools, we've agreed that this is really, really important. Core values is just as important as learning actual knowledge in school, languages, math, whatever. Uh, but the difference is, the big difference here is that the core values block doesn't have a, a, a manual. It doesn't have this point, uh, kind of this list of things to do uh, for teachers. So we don't have, you know, for a fifth grade teacher, uh, kind of a, a checklist. This is what you should do with your students in order to, you know, make sure that your, your students are uh, learning this stuff and, and working with core values. And that's kind of an issue in Sweden because, uh, as in many countries, uh, I presume, many teachers um, in schools feel like they have um, a lot on their hands. Uh, they're overworked, many of them feel like uh, time is short, uh, and they, they sometimes feel like they really don't have the, the time to sit and plan and, you know, kind of, okay, so how should I, you know, do the core values thing today? And so, so in, in many cases, unfortunately, some of this stuff is lost, and we are solely focused on, on the knowledge part. And I would say that's uh, really sad, because you know, it, this is one of those protective factors and, and, uh, and uh, children's mental health and well-being, you, we have to focus on it in order for them to be able to learn in a good way. So, um, so that's kind of an issue in Sweden. I don't know, I would, if, if anyone has some insights on how this look, how it is uh, in other countries, I would be really interested to hear. Um, but so core values, really important, but we don't always live up to, to the assignment that we have. Um, so in short. And so what Laika is, is basically a kind of a core values platform that where we try to make things easy for schools in Sweden. So we have modules and we have lessons and we have a lot of stuff that you can just take and grab and do uh, as it is or, or kind of, you know, um, or change up and, and, you know, according to what your um, situation is. Um, and we have different themes, uh, but, the, but the big picture is uh, discrimination, harassment, bullying. Uh, and, you know, we, it's, it's a lot of different, um, different kind of lessons. We have, as we said, the kind of the, the, we have some short films, we have other kind of materials. 
uh, available. And uh, we also have obviously based Leica on uh, you know, the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the Global Goals, uh, because these are also very, very important things to work with in, in school. So we're trying to kind of have a holistic approach uh, and make it easy for teachers. That's kind of the key word, uh, to save time and, and, uh, and uh, be kind of a helping hand. Uh, in a situation that can be very tough. Um, and um, we know that teachers want to work with these things. They think it's important. So nobody's saying that this is not, uh, core values isn't, uh, isn't important, but it's just the time and you know the inspiration to actually sit down and plan classes and lessons. We're trying to make that easier. So that's kind of how it looks. And the basics um, in Leica, uh, you know, there are a lot of things. Uh, but we kind of focus on preventative uh, actions and then actions when the damage is done. We like to kind of um, uh, put, put that into two different groups. Uh, and the preventative actions, I would say, that we focus on the most is to kind of make sure that there are almost daily conversations about core values um, in schools with a focus on building relationships and trust. Because that's also something that we know, uh, both from experience and research uh, globally, that uh, students who feel comfortable, who have a good relations, uh, relationship to adults in school uh, or adults in general, uh, are more likely to come to us and tell us when something is wrong. Because I think all of us know the big problem here is uh, when children, you know, no matter what the problem is, if something happens and they don't tell anyone, that's when we're in trouble. So really focusing on these relationships and, and creating a safe space and an open environment also. Uh, because a lot of these questions, uh, children and young people, they're, we have to remember that they're experiencing things for the first time. Um, you know, falling in love or, or breaking up for me without uh, the internet uh, in the same extent was a lot easier, I would say, than it is today. Because today everything is kind of displayed out there and, and you have an infinite you know, amount of information and, and stuff coming in all the time. Uh, so, you know, experiencing, oh my goodness, I'm going over time. Okay, quickly. Sorry, guys. I'm blaming my mom brain again. So, but yeah, uh, we're trying to help students understand the connections and risks and possibilities and, and really see things from different perspectives. And then also have some experience-based exercises and interactivity. And when the damage is done, that means when something has happened online, uh, something negative, uh, really important for schools to understand that we have to take what has happened seriously, to convey to the child, I see you, I hear you, this is serious, we're going to do something. Something. Uh, because as adults, we sometimes think, oh, that happened online, Snapchat, just, you know, delete the app, whatever. This does not work for children and young people. Uh, and then also help gather evidence to find out what's happened. Really in important to have that investigative um, approach. And then involve parents and report to the police if, if have to. So really take things seriously. Uh, and in Leica, we have uh, this holistic approach, as I said earlier. So we have materials for teachers. We have for after-school youth recreation centers. We have for student health offices, the school board, and also for parents. So we want everybody to get involved, not just one teacher here, one teacher there, but everybody, because that's how we make a difference. And this is just an example of some posters that you can put up at your school in Swedish. Um, uh, just to visualize. And for parents, we have the parent site uh, that was created together with Tele2, the operator, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then also we have um, a presentation for parent-teacher conferences and then uh, a parent's guide as well that you can download for free. And uh, since I'm over time, I'm just going to wrap it up really quickly. Uh, it was all I had to say. Uh, here are some uh, contact information. I would love uh, if any of you have a, a question or, or insights or anything uh, from, from your schools or from your context where you're working, if you would like to share with me, uh, either uh, by uh, email, you have it here, or LinkedIn or whatever. So, um, um, yeah, really looking forward to uh, hearing from you guys more. And I hope uh, um, it was coherent what I tried to, <laughs> tried to say. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, and uh, actually our time here is up, uh, so, but I think we can uh, say like this instead. If you have any questions to speakers, we will uh, uh, we'll be here in a minute or two, so come down and take your questions directly to them. Uh, otherwise, I need to hand over to the keynote speaker in A1. So we end here, and thank you all the speakers, and thank you for, for joining here today.